In this video, I'd like to take a close look, inside and out, at what I think to be one of the most important, but less regarded, German tanks of World War II. This vehicle, the SDKFZ-141 Panzer III. The story of German tank development goes back to the 1920s, and particularly 1927, and the final withdrawal of post-World War I occupying forces. And that left the Reichswehr, the very small armed forces that Germany had been allowed under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, a bit freer to start thinking about rebuilding and rearming. But even before this, officers like General Hans von Siecht had begun to lay the groundwork for a future mechanised force. At first, this had to be done through subterfuge, using wooden tank mock-ups and building tracked vehicles like the Gross Tractor and Leich Tractor. These are disguised as agricultural vehicles. These laid the basis for the mechanical development of tanks, developing elements like transmission and suspension. German officers were also sent to train in the USSR, looking at tank tactics. Pioneering work had also been done in terms of construction and particularly the welding of armour plate. At a time when most AFVs relied on riveted construction, welding meant tank hulls could be lighter and stronger. This was useful progress, but even when full rearmament gets underway, tank production has to compete for resources with aircraft, ships, and even the construction of static fortifications. The first two designs accepted into service, the Panzer I and Panzer II, were deemed too small and too light for effective combat. And General Heinz Guderian, rising star of the Panzerwaffe, stated they should only be used as training vehicles. As things turned out, and lacking anything else, they made up over half of the tank force that deployed into Poland in 1939 and the campaign in the West in 1940. The next two designs, Panzer III and Panzer IV, were very similar in size, weight and design which begs the question of why would an army want two very similar tanks? The answer is that the Panzer III uh, was intended to be the principal gun tank of the Panzer divisions. And it was, as planned, to be armed with a 50mm gun, which would be effective against enemy armour. The Panzer IV was designed to be a Begleitswagen. Um, an escort tank, if you like, and that was fitted with a short barreled 75mm. That would fire high explosive and it would take care of things like anti tank guns, infantry formations, the sort of targets that the Panzer III was less able to engage. For the Panzer III, design submissions were invited from four companies Daimler Benz, Krupp, MAN, and Rheinmetall. After testing during 1935 and 36, the contract to develop the tank was awarded to Daimler-Benz. The first four models, as forms A to D, were developmental stages, testing different suspension and wheel configurations before settling on this one. Torsion bar suspension with six pairs of road wheels and three return rollers. It's a rear engine tank with transmission and sprocket wheels at the front and an idler at the back. The engine itself, which we'll look at in a moment, is the 12-cylinder Maybach HL120 TRM petrol engine, and that gives you 295 horsepower. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can, and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. Our Panzer III is an Ausführung L, it was built by MAN in Nuremberg in June 1942. It shipped via Naples to Benghazi, and then it was issued to uh, the 7th Light Company of Panzer Regiment 8, and that's part of 15th Panzer Division. It was then captured at Alam Halfa uh, in September 1942. Now, there are some modifications, uh, specific to using these vehicles in the desert, and we'll look at those a little bit later on. Going back to basics, the hull is made in three parts. The whole of the lower hull is one component, and the upper hull split into two. The Bugpanzer at the front, and the Heckpanzer at the back. These are both of welded construction, but bolt down onto the lower hull. This allows different armour thicknesses, front and rear. 
looking at the front of the tank, the glassy area, this is not like the Panzer IV. These are not hatches for the crew. Uh, they're access hatches so that you can get at uh, the front of the gearbox and the final drives. And then other fittings, these are breathers. They're air intakes for cooling the steering brakes. Standard headlights, one of which has suffered a bit of battle damage. And then over here is the Notec Townshanwerfer. That's a tactical driving light. So it shines downwards and forwards, but not upwards. Front of the glassy has extra armor. It's got a 20 mil Vorpanzer. And that's attached with fairly simple brackets, um, but it gives you a standoff distance of 100 millimeters between the Vorpanzer and then the original 30 millimeter armor. Down here on the lower hull, uh, there's a bracket for a length of spare track. And that of course also gives you a bit more extra protection. 30 millimeters was the maximum armor thickness on the turret and hull, going down to 16 millimeters on the decks, belly and turret roof. That doesn't seem a great deal, but remember, this is a pre-war design. As well as the Vorpanzer and extra track, Panzer III's are often seen with Schertzen on their sides and turret later in the war to try and add extra protection from weapons like anti-tank rifles. You can see the ball mount for the radio operator's MG34. Then over on this side, uh, there's the driver's armoured visor. The actual vision block is scarred by impact. Just above that, there's two small holes. They are for a binocular sight, which he uses when the armoured shutter is down. Looking at the turret, both Panzer III and Panzer IV turrets were designed by uh, the same guy, an engineer called Zimmer. And I think that's quite obvious from the similarity in their appearance. And they both have side hatches either side and then a cupola, cast steel cupola for the commander with a mount for an MG34 machine gun. The gun fitted to this Ausführung L is the long-barreled KWK 39 L60 50 mm gun. Now it had been intended to fit a 50 mm uh, all along, but it wasn't ready. So the Asforung E through to F wound up with the 37 mm KWK 36. That was slightly better than the French 2.5 centimeter gun, not as good in my opinion, as the British two pounder, um, but it became rapidly outclassed. And of course, it's a derivation of the Pack 3536, the, uh, the thing they called the uh, Panzer Anklopf Gerat, the uh, tank door knocker. Later Asforung Fs up to Asforung J were fitted with the shorter barreled L42 50 millimeter. Following which Asforung L to M tanks mounted the 50 mm L60, like this one. The reason this vehicle was selected for evaluation after capture and brought back to the UK is it's fitted with the longer barreled L60 gun. And that was a weapon the British Army hadn't encountered before. Uh, now the L60, the KWK 39, uses practically the same ammunition as the PAC-38 anti-tank gun. The only difference being that the PAC ammunition is fired with a conventional primer. The tank ammunition is fired electronically. The Panzergranate 39 APCBC round had a muzzle velocity of 835 meters per second and would penetrate 38 millimeters of 30 degree sloped armor at 1,000 meters. Finally, in the long story of Panzer III upgunning, a number of Ausführung Ns were converted to carry the KWK 37, that was the short barreled 75mm gun. Um, that was previously carried by the Panzer IV in its role as a Begleitswagen, uh, a support tank. But it's also a sort of role reversal because the Panzer IV now carries a long 75 uh, and it's become a gun tank. Looking at the back of the tank, under the hull overhang, uh, you've got the twin exhausts and silencers. Uh, here is the towing eye. And then just above that, there is a rack for five smoke candles. And canisters are fitted to these. Everybody thinks about smoke discharges being stuck on the turret. 
but in fact these are quite commonly used in the period and they're operated from inside the tank in order to generate a, a localised smoke screen. Up here above the left rear mudguard this is the Notec rear light, uh, same company that produced the Tanshan Verfa on the front and it is used for convoy driving at night. We're now going to get inside and take a look at the vehicle interior and the fighting compartment. Now, as I said earlier, this Panzer III has been very painstakingly restored. So what you're seeing is a vehicle whose appearance is very, very true to how it would have been originally during World War II. It's frankly pretty tight in here, even by World War II tank standards. The Crew positions are fairly standard, so there's three in the turret. Commander, centre here, the gunner over on the left, and then the loader on the right-hand side. Uh, now, there's no turret basket, so the loader's going to have to move round as the turret turns. Uh, and most of the ammunition stowage, bin down here, is in the rear corners of the turret. So that's going to be a bit of a scramble although it won't be as much of a scramble as it would have been in the T-34, where the ammunition is actually underneath the turret floor. I'm sitting in the commander's position. He has a cast steel cupola with five vision blocks, and they are blocks, they're not periscopes. And then at the front, there is a sighting vane. Uh, he actually sits on a, a storage box, but he's got a backrest, and then a pair of footrests down below. In front of him is the recoil guard for the 50mm gun, and on this side of the recoil guard there's a stencil reading Lufthohledruck, 32 kilograms per square centimetre, and that's the necessary air pressure for the recoil recuperator. Let into this side of the recoil guard there is a recoil gauge, and it reads foyer pores. Um, and what that means is cease firing, because that's the point at which recoil is becoming dangerous and the recoil mechanism will need adjusting or recharging. To the left of the commander is the gunner's position um, and uh, you've got his telescopic sight here uh, with the brow pad. Um, traverse and elevation hand wheels and he's got a bucket seat that I'm actually sitting in and there are two beams that support his footrest, which also incorporates a pedal that operates the coaxial machine gun over on the other side of the turret. Looking towards the rear bulkhead, we have the ammunition stowage. 84 rounds for the KWK-39, with the usual 60-40 split between high explosive and armour piercing. This lever on the rear bulkhead operates the smoke candles. If we duck under the recoil shield, we have the driver and radio operator's positions. As I said earlier, they have no separate hatches, so they have to enter and leave via the turret, and that must have been quite interesting in an emergency. There is also a small hatch in the floor. I mean, it's not big enough to be used as an escape hatch, but it might be useful for getting rid of spent brass or uh, perhaps other things you wouldn't want floating around in such a confined space. The driver's controls the standard configuration of steering tillers, clutch, accelerator and brake pedals, gear change on the right, and then the instrument panel. As we mentioned earlier, the driver has a vision block with an armoured shutter. When this is closed, he swings over a binocular sight which operates through two small holes in the glassy armour. On the right of the hull is the radio operator come hull machine gunner's position. The MG34 is fitted in a ball mount. The radio equipment is the FUG5, the Funke Gerat Funf a VHF transmitter come receiver. On a moving tank, this had a range of voice of about four kilometers, with morse up to about eight kilometers. The box down by the radio operator's right has the plugs for his earphones and throat mic. There's also a partial intercom, which was quite an innovation for the time. The commander and radio operator could both talk and listen to one another, and the driver had headphones, but no intercom. In the early part of the war particularly, Good radio communications gave the Wehrmacht a huge advantage over enemies such as the French in 1940 and the Soviets in 1941. As I mentioned previously, this is a superbly restored Panzer III, and a lot of the credit for that rests with one man, Mike Hayton, our 
former workshop manager, that we're going to talk to now. Mike, you know more about this tank. I mean, you know every nut and bolt of this tank. You masterminded the restoration, the major project. What I'd like to ask you is your opinion of the Panzer III. But from an engineering perspective, how good is it? In my opinion, it's through the roof. Um, when we first took the tank on in way, way back in 2000, we were surprised. Every single nut and bolt we, we undid on it, we were surprised by how beautifully made it was all, it was all made. Uh, and also the innovations, all of the things that we didn't expect to find on a tank of this age. And it was beautifully engineered and beautifully made. And it's been a favourite of mine for a long time. Um, how, how good a platform is it? How well is it? It was, again, well, well ahead of its time. Mm. Um, the, the thought that went into um, the build quality and, and also things to help the crew. You, you know, there are lots of little things in, inside the tank which, um, which just help the crew make, make it a better day for them. Mm. Um, and also the, the in, interior is, for a tank of this size, is very well laid out. Even though it's cramped, it's certainly not as cramped as other tanks I could mention. When we first went, went into the archives and we found some manuals, we discovered that it had got a, a fully synchromesh gearbox, mm. which in those days was unheard of, which means you can change gear very easily without crashing the gears and so on. But also there, there's a li little thing, for instance, on the gear lever. Um, you can't inadvertently go into the wrong gear. If you go from, say, second gear to third, you have to press a little lever on the top of the, on the, the gate of the gearbox so that it goes into the correct gear. So you, you can't possibly get it into the wrong gear. Mm. Uh, and also there's another little lever for, for reverse, so you pull the gear, gear lever right over against you, press the little lever and it goes into reverse. I think that is driver aids big time in those days. Mm. Um, and also the tank is so quiet. It's as, literally as quiet as a car. I it's got that, car yes. type yeah. silencers. So for the crew inside the thing, it's not as noisy as, for instance, Tiger, when you can't hear yourself shout little and talk. Mm. Um, also, the, 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 I must tell you about the clutch operation. This is, in my opinion, typically glute German. So when you press the clutch pedal to change gear, there's a shaft goes from the clutch pedal to a little gearbox, which has got two bearings in. That then goes to another little gearbox with another two bearings mm. in, then another one at the back <laughs> of the tank. Then a shaft goes across the tank to another one, and then it operates the clutch. Oh. Unbelievable. So there's about, I don't know, eight sets of bearings just to operate the clutch. This is actually... This tank's done a lot of miles over the years, hasn't it? Yes, when, when we, we first attacked it in, in 2000, it, it, it was actually a runner, but water and oil used to come from every orifice and, um, and it'd been knocked about by, by a lot of people. It went to Chertsey at the, after its capture. And even in Chertsey, the thing caught on fire and the whole rear end shows signs of, um, of sort of major damage. Mm. We think the petrol tank went up. Um, we don't know how, how far it travelled in this country, but we know that in, in the sort of late 90s, um, sorry, late 80s, early 90s, it was campaigned up on the, uh, whenever they had the tank displays. Mm. Um, and I used to watch it and, and think, stop knocking it about, but anyway, they, they did. And, <laughs> um, and eventually, when I got my hands on it, that's the last time it was knocked about. When, um, when you started stripping it down, Big areas were still full of desert sand, weren't they? Yes, um, it was so compacted that we had to get to chisels and chisel it out. So, for instance, there's a false floor in it. So between the hull and the floor, there's, there's a sort of three or four inch gap. And when we took the floor plates up, it was literally like concrete. And every single part, in, for instance, the driver's visor behind me, that was completely seized. And we thought, oh, that's rust, you know, from age. It was just pure sand. And uh, it took us ages and ages to, to get it all out, but we did eventually, and we got everything working on it that we could. Looking at the back deck, there are four access hatches with armoured ventilators. The main engine air intakes are on either side of the deck. They also seem to have been used as a convenient storage point for spare track pins. So, Mike, we've got the back decks up. Uh, we're looking down into the engine bay. Um, the engine is somewhat inevitably for a German tank. It's a Maybach, an yeah. HL2, uh, 120. Um, could you just talk us through what we're actually looking at here? Yeah. 
So first of all, on the on the far side from where I am, um, the batteries are obviously modern ones, but if you look at the battery tray, it's much longer and it would have had two huge acid batteries, um, typical of the time. Um, these were a lot safer to use um, and, and also we probably couldn't get them anyway. So moving across, this little cable here is the inertia starter because the tank has two starters. Um, the inertia which is operated from the back on a, on a uh, starting handle and obviously the electric starter and it was always German practice that if the tanks mm -hmm. stood for any length of time to use the inertia because a lot of the engines mm -hmm. leak water mm -hmm. and you can get something called hydraulic lock so um, the inertia was used quite a lot you've got the V12 engine sat in the middle with two twin choke Solex carburetors underneath this part of the hole um, these are oil bath air filters and um, there's two ways of operating and they can drag air from within the engine compartment or there's two levers inside the tank you can just see there where air air for the carburetors can come from inside the tank which obviously would be a little bit cleaner. Am I right in thinking the oil bath filters are a, an adaptation for desert use? I'm not a hundred percent certain but I would say so yes. Yeah but I'm not because obviously certain. this this tank was designed for effectively a, a European war it wasn't really designed to be operated in North Africa so I think they, they had to make adaptations in terms of oil bath filters also quite a lot of extra ventilation I think as well. Yes um, so we, we've got these two big flaps each side of the, um, the, the hole and these can be opened to drag air in through this part here to cool the radiators or the air can be pulled in from inside the tank. So that's a way of not sucking half the western desert into, <laughs> into right. your engine basically. It can, all, it can all be operated from inside the tank so yeah. you don't need to just stand outside. Yeah. Here we have the fuel tank um, and it's one of the few things that we've done to the tank which, which wasn't original um, but we didn't have a lot of choice at the time. The original tank, the complete floor of the tank was, was missing and full of rust and corrosion and so we made a decision to because, um, because you can't take the fuel tank out, you have to remove the whole slab of the top of the tank. So you end up with an empty hull. That's the only way that the fuel tank will come out. So we made a decision to cut a hole in the, in the side of the tank, which is behind this armour, uh, make a fuel tank, slide it in, and then re-weld re up the hole. And so instead of holding 20 or 30 gallons, it holds 12 gallons, which is more than enough for what we use the tank for. Hmm. So the original tank is still there, still there but yeah. you've actually put a liner inside, which yeah. is a, yeah, it's a nice piece of conservation. If, if it ever did have to be restored, it's not a big job. No, no. Um, also, interestingly, the, the whole colours <coughs> by the batteries is the original paint. We've, anything that was, was not damaged, we left. And so even though it looks a bit rough, it is the original paint from, from when the tank was operated during hmm. the Second World War. Now, you told me something a little bit earlier that I didn't know. There's a bit of battle damage on this, which might be quite significant, I think. Yes, it's, again, it's something that we, we think might have happened, but we don't know. Um, so on this side, underneath this flap, there's a bullet hole. And we know that there's a bullet hole there, and the bullet or the shell exited through that hole, mm. which is directly in line with the radiators. And we know that this radiator is definitely not the original one. Um, so maybe that played a part in it, we don't know. It could have mm. been done before the tank was captured and the, and the radiator you know, replaced before the, tank, before the capture, but we don't know. But it's interesting that it's very close to the radiators and it did have radiator problems. So, I mean, we've talked about the fact it's, it's very ergonomic, it's very well designed for the crew. What's it like to drive? Well, I was lucky enough or fortunate enough to drive it for a number of years before uh, the volunteers jumped in and took it off me. Um, <laughs> And it was a joy to drive. Um, first of all, you sit in a leather seat. You have a little leather pad above your head to stop you bumping your head on the, on the, on the ceiling. And of course, that's in leather as well. The operation of the levers is, is very, very smooth because again, it, the Germans rely heavy on loads and loads of bearings. The more bearings they can pull the things, the better it mm. works. And um, so for instance, when you're traveling forward in the tank, you can say, for instance, if you want to turn right, you pull the lever halfway and it disconnects the drive to one of the tracks. So when you accelerate, because it's driving on one track, it does a nice gradual turn. Mm. Um, if you want to do things a bit quicker, you have to go down to walking pace, which is really what the tank was used for quite a lot. Mm. 
Um, and you pull this lever back a bit further and it actually locks the track and does a skid turn. Mm. That's the only two means of steering the tank. But that was common in, in, in that era, in those days. Other little aids for the driver, which are insignificant really, but important. For example, there are two blue lights above the driver's head, just in front of him. Um, one right and one left. So if the gun barrel goes over the side of the tank, the light comes on to tell him that the, the, the tank is wider than it was before. I mean, it's done a lot more miles in this country over the years uh, than um, it ever did in German army service. What about its reliability? It's been marvellous, really. Mm. We've had no big problems with it. We've always done the maintenance. We've always uh, tried to stay ahead of the game. Mm. Uh, and when you talk about miles as well, it's been used for so many films. Um, the BBC hired it um, for their big event, I can't remember, years ago now. And we're over in this southern area for days on end, driving it up and down. And it's just completely reliable, you know. It's 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 been it's been amazing, really. And I still think it's one of the best here, anyway. The Panzer III is a pre-war design that is in frontline use for pretty well the whole of World War II, and certainly for the early part of that period, it's the principal gun tank of the Panzer divisions. It sees service on the Eastern Front, in Europe, in North Africa. But how good was it? At the beginning of the war, Panzer III's and Panzer IV's were intended to operate together. Three companies of threes with a support company of fours. The threes being the principal gun tanks, with the fours able to provide the support with high explosive when needed. The fighting in Poland in 1939 and France in 1940 exposed two of the Panzer III's weaknesses. Thin armour, unable to withstand even an anti-tank rifle round, and an inadequate 37mm gun, which couldn't cope with French heavy armour. It's worth remembering that the Panzer III was really designed with a, a European war in mind. It wasn't designed the extremities of Western Desert or the Eastern Front. And in the desert particularly, there are a number of adaptations that have to be made. Uh, things like oil bath filters to stop dust clogging the engine, better ventilation, and also wider tracks. The basic 30mm armour of the Panzer III could be penetrated by a British two-pounder AP round at 1,500 metres. And the British were unimpressed with the 37mm armed Panzer III's. But the tide turned when L42 and L60 50mm armed tanks became more than a match for the British Crusaders and US supplied M3 Stuarts. The Panzer III in turn met its match in North Africa uh, when 75mm armed M3 Grants and M4 Shermans arrive. Uh, although it did have a bit of a swan song later on, the 16 s 4 ends like this one, uh, which are armed with the KWK 37 short 75mm gun, uh, arrive as support for 20 Tiger Ones as part of Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 501. Now this tank, this as n which was captured in Tunisia um, somewhere in April, May 1943, may be one of that original 16. On the Eastern Front, the shortcomings of the Panzer III are shown up pretty starkly against Soviet armour like the KV-1 and the T-34. And the T-34 particularly has better mobility, thicker armour, and a much more powerful 76.2 mm gun. To quote a report, the Russian tanks usually open fire at a range of 1,000 metres and deliver enormous penetration and accuracy. Our 50 mm KWK guns can only achieve penetration on vulnerable locations and at very close range. This really spells the end of the line for the Panzer III as a frontline gun tank. It is completely outclassed by the M4 Shermans and the T-34s. And by late 1943, it's being relegated to minor combat roles and used as a training vehicle. I haven't got time in this video to go into all the Panzer III variants, I mean, things like the Befehlswagen and the Flammpanzer and the whole host of others. But it would be very remiss not to mention the fact that the reliable, robust chassis of the Panzer III was used as the basis for this, the Stug III. 
which is a remarkable assault gun turned tank destroyer. In conclusion then, the Panzer III is a pre-war design. It is well engineered, it's robust, it's reliable, it's, actually, it's a very good platform. It's capable of being up-armoured and up-gunned, but in spite of that, it is still pretty well obsolete by mid-war. Now, the Panzer III may not have the cachet of the Tiger or the Panther, but it plays a pivotal role in equipping the Panzer Panzerwaffe. Thanks for watching. Do hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like, subscribe, and if you can, support us on Patreon.